Okay, so the recording started and welcome back and welcome to those joining live on the Facebook channel. <laughs> we might try the YouTube channel next time to get you all off Facebook, but we did promise to stream it on Facebook this time. So we are keeping our promises. So this is the third evening talk. And for those of you following so far, we're going through the five indrias or spiritual faculties. And the first day, because there were six days, I talked about virtue, which is not one of the spiritual faculties, but it's the foundation for all the good qualities. If the foundation gets wobbly or weak, then the other things kind of tumble down. It's a bit like when you build a really tall building with a very poor foundation and that foundation kind of cracks or, and then you start to see all the cracks in the walls and the top part starting to fall down. So usually you get into trouble with the health and safety or the buildings commission or whatever, if that happens. So in the same way, we want to make our meditation strong by developing really deep foundations for practice. And so yesterday, we talked about sada confidence, which I translated as inspired confidence. And today we're on the second indria of energy, which can be seen as a direct outcome of that sada. And I have to say, my experience yesterday um, talking about sada or confidence did give me a lot of energy because I love that subject so much. And just reflecting on the power and the beauty of the Dhamma, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha and also our own capacity for awakening really roused energy in me and with that gladness as well. Today, something also very nice happened. Um, the people who are very generously allowing me to stay in their house, and this is actually their little dhamma hall at the top of the house, so it has a lot of good meditation energy. They came around to, uh, to offer food to me and they did it so beautifully. There was so much joy involved, even though we did it in silence. And um, I chanted a blessing for Jasmine, the person who offered. And uh, I just felt so much joy and gladness arising in my mind as a result of that. You know, the confidence and the faith, the inspiration in people's goodness and generosity. And then the capacity of that to arouse energy in me. And uh, I hadn't expected to give a blessing chant. I was going to stay completely in silence and just kind of generate quiet meta. But actually, it helped to rouse even more energy and enthusiasm in myself. And hopefully that was shared with her as well. So energy can also be understood as a kind of interest or enthusiasm, uh, a quality of perseverance, um, there's a word in Pali called atapi, and it's sometimes translated as kind of um, exertion. Atapi sampajano satima. I'm trying to think of the uh, diligent, I think they translate it as. But to me, it's almost like a gentle perseverance that we just keep on the task. We don't get dissuaded. We don't lose confidence. We don't fall into apathy, indifference or despair. And also this energy can help to overcome these finer hindrances, they're called upakilesas. So we have the five hindrances of greed or sensual desire of anger and ill will and anything in that category of sloth and torpor, doubt and restlessness and worry. But there are two finer hindrances called arati and tandi, which are like weariness and discontent. And I think these are really low energy states of mind, you know, when the mind isn't being fed, it isn't being nourished enough. And then we just get a bit sloppy, we get a bit couldn't care less. And I think at the moment, you know, in society in general, this is a danger for all of us because the corona pandemic has been dragging on and on. And there is a lot of apathy around, a feeling like of hopelessness that this will just continue on forever. And so we really need to learn to how to gladden and empower and encourage the mind and give us that boost of mental energy. In Ayurveda, which is um, a health discipline, it's actually traditional Indian medicine that I studied before ordaining, um, the word vidya is used for the potency of medicines. So the medicine will either be shita or ushna vidya, that means hot or cold. And according to that potency, it has a certain effect on the tissues, on the body. So it has certain abilities to cure us. So what, how much potency does our own meditation have to cure our mental diseases? 
we need some potency there. It needs to have a kind of uh, active principle. And uh, I was staying also in a, a yoga center recently. And the lady there, she had a book by Swami Shivananda. It was a recipe book. And he'd written something in there about um, mental vitamins. So he said the mental vitamin A is for like adaptability, B for bravery, balance, C for courage, uh, compassion or contentment, D for diligence or discipline, and E for equanimity and endurance. <laughs> so these are like the mental vitamins we can take, these beautiful qualities. And these qualities are also a result of energy in the mind. Yeah, we have energy that we can put into things. And that energy is different from the energy in the world because in meditation and in Buddhism, the energy is not roused by making lots and lots of effort. It's actually roused by giving. It's roused by a kind of sacrifice. So it's like a sacrificial energy that gives everything to the practice, that gives your whole heart to the moment. And that really lets go, yeah? Somebody asked a question earlier about letting go, and I thought it was a very profound and important question about whether letting go stems from aversion or, or whether letting be would be something much more skillful and wise. And I think it's really just a matter of how we interpret those words, but also that we have to learn to let things be, first of all. If we move from you know, what we experience to immediately letting go of that experience rather than letting go of our negative relationship to it, then we do end up pushing things away. Whereas letting be stays with things long enough for them to start to unfold. And it's the letting be, the passive awareness that enables that energy in the mind to increase. And once the energy increases, we can see what we need to let go of and what is good to cultivate and to preserve in the mind. So I have a little quote here, and I think this is by Thich Nhat Hanh, but it's a very nice little definition of energy. And he calls that energy, perseverance, effort, vigor, or enthusiasm. Virya, the perfection of vigor, invites us to connect with the essential energy that moves us to practice joy and perseverance in the face of all we encounter. When practicing video, we become aware of the fresh energy released when we connect with our pure intentions. So you see how it starts from wholesome intention. Unattached to selfish outcomes, we awaken the bodhicitta, the desire to realize enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. So we don't necessarily have this word bodhicitta, I think, in the Pali canon. It's more of a Mahayana concept. But the point is that enlightenment always benefits all beings. And if it's motivated by that selflessness, by those pure intentions, then you can be sure that you have the right motivation for practice. He says, this is an inexhaustible source of vitality that we can call on to maintain our practice. Like the energy of an ox, we can keep going even in the face of adversity. adversity. Virya, or energy, is the ultimate antidote which overcomes cynicism, apathy, and despair. It provides full confidence to pursue the path. So again, you see this kind of reciprocal relationship between the confidence as a foundation for energy, and also that energy leads to even more confidence. So how does energy arise in the mind? And we've already talked about inspiration and confidence. That inspiration can also be to do with nature, to do with being in beautiful places, or to do with being associated with wise friends, having gladdening conversations that uplift the mind. It can also arise from the motivation to develop beautiful states of mind. And the Buddha says, you know, check out your virtue, check out whether you're really living a beautiful ethical life. And if you find you are, he says, then, and you find that your con conduct has been irreproachable, that you've not caused yourself or others any undue harm, then one should abide happy and glad, training night and day in wholesome states. So we can reflect on our virtue and this can give us the motivation and the energy to continue 
to train all day and all night even. I don't quite know how to do that in the sleep, but uh, you can have a go, at least if you wake up in the night. And I think some of you are saying that you're not sleeping too well. You can decide, okay, I'm awake, I'm aware. Let me incline my mind to something beautiful. Maybe again, practicing loving kindness or um, just sending metta to yourself. You know, may I be happy and just say some very gentle and calming words. And have trust that if you protect your mind, even when you have a sleepless night, you won't be tired in the morning. That's happened to me so many times, especially when I started to give talks and I was so nervous about it because really my energy for giving talks is from the love of the Dhamma. It's not at all because I'm a natural public speaker. And it's something that I actually used to find quite terrifying, to be quite honest with you. But um, yeah, after having a couple of sleepless nights before teaching, it was really extraordinary that in the morning I would feel still quite um, energetic. And I started to recognize that the anxiety was also a kind of adrenaline. So when I started to shift my awareness of anxiety and actually notice the energy involved in that, I could use it in a positive way. I could trust it a little bit and think, OK, this adrenaline may mean that I give my best, I give my all. And that's how I started to regard it. And also that the teaching is an offering. It's, uh, it's not about a sense of self. It's really about giving whatever we can to share with others. And in that, there's very much joy. That's also an aspect of virtue, just generosity, giving, giving away without expecting anything in return. As a factor of enlightenment, which energy also is, it actually comes as a result of mindfulness and also investigation, investigation of states of mind. And this is really interesting because it's actually um, a result, again, of developing the wholesome. And the Buddha says that all of these enlightenment factors depend on seclusion on, I think I wrote it down somewhere. They depend, yeah. So all of these enlightenment factors, do you know what they are? Does everybody know what they are or not? No nods, I'll read them. <laughs> so the seven enlightenment factors are like the antidotes, the opposites, if you like, to the five hindrances. So as much as those five hindrances are overcome, the enlightenment states or the enlightenment factors have a chance to arise. And when all these enlightenment factors are strong, then we have a chance to see things as they truly are and actually experience Nibbana. So the Buddha encourages to develop mindfulness, <clears throat> investigation, energy, and then PT or rapture, which leads to tranquility of mind, to stillness and to equanimity. And he says that all of these are based on seclusion. So we seclude ourselves from unwholesome states of mind. We seclude ourselves from activities that dissipate energy, yeah? And those activities can be internal or external. If we're sort of sitting around contemplating all the things that have gone wrong today, then we find our energy gets drained. Or if we're sitting around having like lots of um, fantasies of the future, also our energy gets quite drained. So we seclude ourselves from unwholesome states and also from unwholesome friendships, unwholesome pursuits. Sometimes I've been on retreat and... Uh, had a lot of time to practice and the mind can become very quiet, very calm, especially in a long retreat of three months. And it was interesting at the end of that retreat to start coming back to the world of the senses and noticing how even just an hour of speaking on the phone and maybe an hour of emails, and I already needed an extra hour's sleep, you know, just because the mind is so busy, the senses are busy. And because of that, the mind gets tired. So they're supported on, by seclusion, also dispassion. So not being so interested in this sensual world. Yeah, because we're not so interested in the world outside, the mindfulness has a chance to grow within. And we turn it around to the objects of our mind. Dispassion can also be seen as a kind of fading away. Things start to fade from our awareness when we don't give them our attention. And that leads to cessation and ripens in release. So these are the kind of foundations for developing the wholesome states. 
And it might sound very technical, it might sound very um, lofty, but if you think about a retreat, this is exactly what you're doing right now. You're secluding yourself from things that are going to draw you outward or draw you away from the practice. You know, things are starting to fade away, your normal activities, your identification with who you are when you're at work, for example. And because of that, things actually cease. Yeah, your job hopefully has ceased for a few days. Your interactions have ceased for a few days. And bit by bit, even your sloth and torpor will start to cease. And all the other hindrances, the more these enlightenment factors develop. Another aspect of uh, energy that I was looking up today in, in the suttas comes from overcoming certain impurities of mind. And there's a sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya called the Chetokila Sutta. It's called the wilderness of the heart. So that kind of sounds quite scary that we might have a wilderness in our heart. And the Buddha describes what a wilderness really means here. So, and as a result of not having these wildernesses, these unwholesome states in the heart, we can develop energy in the mind. So he says, energy arises when a bhikkhu is not doubtful, uncertain, undecided, or unconfident about the teacher. And thus the mind inclines to ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving. As the mind inclines to ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving, the first wilderness in the heart has been abandoned. So those wildernesses of doubt, uncertainty, being undecided, unconfident about the teacher. And the next ones are the same, but about the Sangha, so about the community of monastics or the enlightened beings who can be lay or monastic, and the Dhamma, the actual teachings. And then the next one is that somebody is not angry or displeased with their companions in the holy life. Or you could even say your spiritual friends, the people that you live with, perhaps, even though they might not be practicing meditation. You're not angry and displeased with them. You can see how that would also drain your energy away. Nor are you resentful or callous towards them. And thus, the mind inclines to ardor, devotion, perseverance and striving. So when one has abandoned these five wildernesses of the heart, one develops the basis for spiritual power consisting in samadhi, that stillness. Due to zeal and determined striving, one develops the basis for spiritual power consisting in samadhi, stillness, due to energy and determined striving. One develops the basis for spiritual power consisting in stillness due to purity of mind and determined striving. And lastly, one develops the basis for spiritual power consisting in samadhi due to investigation and determined striving. And enthusiasm is the fifth. So here we can see how this determined striving, in other words, gentle persistence, I prefer as a translation, just not giving up so easily. And enthusiasm and zeal, inspiration, energy, all of these things lead eventually to stillness, so long as we channel that energy the right way. So how do we actually direct our mind skillfully to arouse that energy? And I think as Ajahn Brown said earlier, it's very different from using physical energy. For the body, we need to kind of exert a bit of effort to rouse you know, good circulation and to get the heart pumping and to make ourselves feel awake and alive. And it's similar in mental energy in the beginning, but only in the beginning, just to rouse enough enthusiasm and motivation and inspiration to sit or to walk in meditation. So rather than controlling, we actually learn to care for our experience. And this is the big difference because control tends to come from a sense of self. Control tends to imply certain expectations, or certain demands that we make, you know, on what we want to experience or how our practice should evolve. Whereas caring is a much softer state of mind that's less about the sense of self, yeah? Caring is less demanding. It simply wishes to care. 
You know, it doesn't mind whether even if, if your care works or not, you care for the sake of caring, you give for the sake of giving. There's no demand and no expectation because you trust in the goodness of kindness and care. You know? So again, that sadha influences the right motivation to our experience. And we're not trying to change the content of our experience, but we're learning how to relate to it in a wholesome way. And it's amazing sometimes when we can get that relationship right, energy can just suddenly flood into the mind because so much of our energy is wasted on trying to change things, struggling with reality, maybe struggling with our thoughts. I don't know how many of you have already been struggling with the thinking mind or even just subtly tensing up around maybe a painful sensation or a doubt. We lose so much energy that way. And when we can see what we're doing with clear mindfulness and learn to let go and make peace with the situation, learn to care instead of control, then suddenly the energy can shift. And I've experienced this so many times. About hmm, 98 or something, a couple of years into my practice, I was in, I think, France in a Vipassana meditation center and for some reason my asthma was triggered and I had a really bad asthma attack in the night and already serving on these retreats is quite energetic it demands quite a lot of uh, time and you have to get up very early so you know I wasn't too happy to be up for so long but I decided to face it and to just try to relax and it was really interesting to see what happened because for about three to four hours I thought I was trying to be aware and I thought I was being equanimous and accepting of the sensations so I was kind of scanning my body to, from head to feet and just trying to relax even though the breathing was very difficult and I was struggling with the breath I was trying to just you know allow it to go out and not to panic around this asthma attack and then at some point, I just noticed that my awareness was kind of skirting around the most difficult area in my chest, the area that really caused a kind of reflex of fear or of panic. And somehow the mindfulness wasn't getting through that part. And as soon as I realized that and saw the resistance and saw the kind of um, struggle with that sensation, the mind mindfulness just seemed to permeate all over my chest and suddenly everything opened up it was really quite extraordinary and it's not the kind of experience that can ever be repeated so if you do have an asthma attack and you have medic medicine there or if you need to call the emergency services please do that but in this particular case I did have my inhaler so I knew I was safe if I really needed to take it or there was somebody on hand but it was very fascinating to see how with that shift of attitude and that lessening of the struggle, the body suddenly could breathe perfectly well again. And that was a real insight for me, you know, that energy arises not from fighting, not from struggling, but actually from letting go, letting go of the struggle, not letting go or pushing away the experience itself. So, also, it's important to direct energy to the wholesome because we always have a choice with the way we look at things in life. There's this story, and I think it comes from um, an indigenous person in America, I forget. And uh, it's a bit of a legend in insight retreat circles as well. And it goes that there was a, a child who came to their father, their wise elder, and they said, oh, I've been dreaming that inside me there lived two wolves and one of them's a black wolf and one of them's white. And these wolves are always in an argument. They're always fighting. And I'm really wondering which one is going to win. And of course, this was a kind of analogy for the, the good and the, and the more um, unwholesome states in this person's mind. Normally the white one indicates the, the goodness and the black one indicates the badness, but I'd like to change it and turn it around. So the black wolf was the good guy or the good girl and the white wolf was symbolizing the negative states of mind. And uh, the wise elder said, the one who wins is the one you feed. That's the one who becomes stronger. That's the one who becomes empowered. So it's not actually a problem that these two wolves 
metaphorically speaking, live inside us. It just depends which one we feed. And we have a choice. We have some influence on that. So in this sense, energy is also related to the four wise endeavors, the right efforts, which are usually translated as um, abstaining from unwholesome, trying to prevent the unwholesome states arising. And if they have arisen, then trying to find ways to overcome them and cultivating and developing the wholesome states in the mind. One of the teachers that I like, that I listen to sometimes called Nikki uh, Mia Ghaffori, she's Iranian-American. She, she said something really lovely in a meditation once. She said, um, why dwell in the dungeons of the mind when you can choose to dwell in the palace, spacious in the heart? I thought that was so lovely because we always do have a choice. You know? If you think about the people in your lives, none of them are perfect, right? Even teachers are not perfect. <laughs> I don't think I've ever met a perfect person before. There'll always be something that triggers us. But we can choose, you know, to incline the mind to those things that annoy us or irritate us or that we'd like to change, or we can incline our minds towards the qualities in that person that we respect and that we'd like to emulate, that we can even learn a lot from. We can really focus in on that. And if you find that there's somebody who you just don't see any redeeming qualities in, then we can learn from that as well, right? We can learn what hurts and harms us. And we can make a determination with gentle persistence and a lot of compassion to steer away from those qualities ourselves and to be a good example to them, perhaps, be a good influence on their life. It's not to say that you should stay in situations that are really unhealthy for you. I think part of the path is always trying to cultivate wholesome conditions for practice and wholesome friendships. Wise friendship is the whole of the spiritual path, the Buddha said, because we are influenced by each other. But we don't have to be the victim. We don't have to just believe that somebody else is wrong and I'm right and there's nothing you know, worthwhile in this person. We can also treat everybody as a teacher, everybody as someone to learn from. And also consider our own goodness and what we have to contribute and offer to others as well. So the last thing I wanted to say about energy, which is actually quite a big topic, is that it has to be applied with balance, and with a sense of adjustment, right? So this is like the simile of the lute in the Buddha's uh, teachings. I think it was a lute. It, had, it was like a string instrument with strings on it. And um, the person went to the Buddha and asked about energy and right effort. And the Buddha used this analogy and he said, well, if you make your strings on this lute really, really tight, can you play a tune? What happens? And uh, I forget his name. I'm sure Derek probably knows. What was the person's name? It wasn't Sona, was it? Was it Sona? Okay, Sona, the lute player. Um, so Sona said to the Buddha, well, you know, it just makes a terrible twang and it's really harsh to the ears. It, it doesn't play a tune at all. And then the Buddha said in a similar way, what happens if you make those strings really, really loose? Well, there's no sound coming out of those strings at all, right? And this is when we go into our meditation without rousing energy in the beginning. Yeah. We just kind of let the mind hang loose and go to sleep and without worrying too much or without any motivation for practice, without really establishing a, a wise relationship, first of all. And the tight mind, of course, the tight string is when we use too much effort and force and we can't sustain the energy because we're just using our energy up at once. And our mind doesn't like us very much. You know, if you have a little delicate breath coming into the mind and you just go at it with your full force, trying to throttle it and grasp it and hold on to it no matter what, that breath gets really scared of you. And next time you sit down to meditate, it says, oh, my goodness, not her again, not him again, not them again. <laughs> you know, it just runs away. So we have to learn how much energy we need to meet the object and to stay with that object for a while, for a time. Yeah. And this is always an experiment. It's always different at different times, depending on our state of mind. Sometimes we are a little bit drowsy and sometimes we might need to just rest the mind. I felt that way this afternoon. I was quite sleepy, quite drowsy. And I thought, I'll just meditate and rest at the same time. So I let my mind just be very lightly with the body and just 
did nothing, just allowed the meditation to be an allowing of whatever was there, noticing that my attention was going more into the knowing than the doing and allowing that mindfulness just to build in its own time because we waste so much energy on doing too much. Other times you might find you're sleepy and you do need a little bit of uh, um, effort, if you like, in the beginning, a little bit of inspiration. So, for example, when you're practicing metta, loving kindness, you might need to use the phrases, first of all, and really take time to cultivate um, an image or a sense of this being that you want to send metta toward. So we invoke this person's presence into our mind and we build up the energy by imagining them happy and glad and getting in touch with that beautiful intention to spread our loving kindness towards them. Even remembering times of happiness that you shared together and then connecting to the words, the sentiments that you wish to share with this very dear person or perhaps someone who really needs loving kindness in your life. Sometimes it could be yourself. But then as that energy builds, you'll find that you need less and less of the phrases. The phrases are just like kindling to start a fire. It's like putting on like bits of paper or small little twigs. And once that kindling's going, you can put on bigger twigs. Yeah. But if you put on huge logs right in the beginning, like if you, if you for example, work with a difficult person before that fire has started, then the whole fire just goes out straight away. There was a funny incident actually in um, Santi Monastery when I was staying there in New South Wales. And uh, we had these little log fire sort of stoves in our rooms, which were kind of oblong. So they were like a tube, very narrow. And just, uh, I think there must've been a hole at the top. And uh, the teacher at the time, who's a good friend and, and spiritual friend of mine, somebody I really respect as a mentor and an elder teacher on the path. Um, he was there for the first time and he hadn't used one of these fires. So he asked me how to uh, light it. And I said, well, you know, you start with the small kindling and then you put on um, some small twigs and then some larger ones. And at the end, you can put on like some really big logs and then the fire lasts for a long time. So he did all that. And then he came back and said, oh, I just got lots of smoke. I just got lots of smoke in the room. I said, oh, really? Did you like do it bit by bit and put the kindling? And then he said, no, I just put it all on at once. <laughs> so he put the kindling and then the other and then the logs before lighting the fire. And that didn't work at all. So I thought that was quite funny. But sometimes we do that in our meditation, you know. Either we start off with too many difficult things or too many aspirations and expectations, or we just kind of make too much effort and it's so much effort that we expire. <laughs> we just burn out too quickly. So the real effort comes through an enthusiasm and a love of developing goodness, a love of developing truth, of understanding truth. And then we learn to use just enough energy to get the meditation going and know when to just relax and back off and it's the same thing with the breath you know I think it can be nice sometimes to start with the meta practice until there's a little bit of gladness and joy in the mind and then the breath already appears quite delightful and it's easy to stay with because of that and as the mind is able to just stay with the breathing stay with the breath for longer and longer we see more of the breath we see more deeply into it. We see its nuances, its subtleties, and that breath starts to open up and look interesting. And this is how the mindfulness increases the energy because the mindfulness starts to develop, energy starts to develop more and more in the mind. It's like the mind's waking up. And when the mind is energized, of course, it feels happy. I don't know about people here, but I notice so many times if I'm feeling a bit down or like, you know, just really struggling with my energy, it's usually because I'm tired, right? And if I just sleep, nothing else has changed in the outside world. My life is still the way it is. And sometimes it's difficult trying to establish a monastery for bhikkhunis in a country where there's a lot of opposition or at least very little support. And sometimes I can get quite disheartened by that. But I notice that if I've had a good rest, then I'm in a better mood. I'm energized. And because of that, I'm glad and I'm happy. And I get inspired by this task. 
So energy really develops through learning how to let things be, learning to let the meditation process unfold and learning to relate to it wisely, allowing the nature, the Dhamma, just to reveal itself to you in its own time. And you really don't need to do much for that. So that was a longer talk than I expected and probably a little packed with information. <laughs> but now I would really like to practice a little while together and see if we can gladden our mind. So please adjust yourselves and get comfortable, however that may be. So I thought that for tonight, you're very welcome to continue practicing with the breath if you wish, if you're getting into that. But for those who are open to this, I would like to practice a little bit of loving kindness together to give you another tool in the kit and something that can help to arouse energy and happiness in the mind. That's one of the special qualities of loving kindness. It arouses energy and happiness by overcoming all those traces of ill will and negativity that we carry inside. So please follow if you wish. But if your mind feels just like resting with the body or with the breath, feel free to do that. Always making peace and being kind. So the loving kindness can be an attitude that we bring to whatever we experience in the here and now. And to start, perhaps just bringing to mind your enthusiasm for practice, your love of the Dhamma, your confidence in the path. Even if you don't think it's very mature or developed yet, it's enough to bring you here and for you to commit a week of your life. And with a sense of curiosity and interest, just gently scanning through the body receiving any information, any sensations that you experience on the way. Caring for that experience, not trying to cure or control, just care. Merely allowing yourself to arrive fully into this moment.
not wasting energy on wishing this moment be any other than on any other way. Just resting with what is. If you wish, you're welcome to just continue being aware with kindness, allowing the practice to unfold in whatever way it will. Or if you'd like to practice loving kindness, see if you can bring to mind a being who is very dear to you. Someone with whom you share an uncomplicated, simple and loving relationship with. Who brings a smile to your mind, to your heart, when you think of them, without much effort at all. You just feel glad. This being may be a benefactor, someone who's helped you, cared for you, given you protection and support. It could be a dear friend, a child, even a pet. And if no one or nothing comes to mind, you can imagine a very cute pet or animal in your mind's eye. And when you visualize this person, this being, it's as though they're sitting in front of you with a smile and you're sharing a beautiful energy together, feeling completely relaxed and at ease in each other's company, caring, not trying to change or control. And connecting to your own body, if it feels comfortable to do so, perhaps connecting to the area around the heart, the chest, or any place where it feels comfortable, where you feel pleasant or neutral sensations of ease, and relaxation. And imagining from this area, beautiful energy of loving kindness, flowing out toward this being, suffusing them with unconditional love. bringing a brightness, a gladness to their features. Putting them even more fully at ease.
And if your fire of loving kindness needs a little bit more kindling, you may wish to offer phrases, wishes of well being, simple wishes. Whatever you really wish for this dear person in your life. Such as, may you be happy. May you be safe. May you be healthy. May you be at peace. It may be just one or two or up to four phrases. To see if you can really connect with a felt sense of the meaning of these words. As though you really were giving a gift of safety or peace or health. To this person and they were receiving it with gratitude and joy. And keep on repeating these phrases, listening to the space between each phrase. Sensing into the emotional resonance, to the meaning of where those words are pointing to, that feeling in your heart. As the mind settles, you may wish to make those spaces longer. Or if you need more kindling, you need to arouse more energy. You can repeat them close together again and again without looking for special results or effects, but just trusting in the power and purity of these intentions to bring about the experience of loving kindness in your own heart. So I'll be quiet and please continue the meditation as you wish. Allowing the mind to incline towards goodness and peace.
And just as in all kinds of meditation, at some point you might realize your mind has wandered into the past or the future. Very gently, when you realize this, simply return to your object, refreshing the image of this person in your mind, a smile, the glimmer in their eyes. Reconnecting with your heart, your body, and those beautiful wishes you wish to offer and share. Practicing with gentle persistence, finding the balance of energy.
Now we're coming close to the end of the practice. And there's just time to choose one more person who you feel is really in need of your loving kindness right now. Or perhaps whose birthday it is today. Perhaps someone sick in hospital or maybe even yourself. And just share this loving kindness with this person too. Not looking for anything special, just being contented to care. And finally, allowing thoughts, wishes, feelings of loving kindness to radiate out towards everyone in this room, your fellow meditators, the co-hosts, perhaps the teachers, all of us sharing this space. May we all be happy and well. May we all experience the beautiful fruits of Dhamma, the peace, the happiness in our hearts, inner happiness. May we all realize the Dhamma that the Buddha himself awakened to. May we all have the virtue, the inspired confidence, and the energy, the heroic energy of giving ourselves to this path with gentle perseverance, without ever giving up. Imagining all beings in this virtual Zoom room and also joining us by Facebook from all over the world, imagining us all with a smile that emanates from the heart. And when you're ready and your smile is ready, <laughs> you can gently open your eyes.
I still don't have the sound settings on the bell. So I apologize if that was more irritating than beautiful. <laughs> For me, it sounds quite nice, but uh, <laughs> without the reverberation, you know, it's just the words, right? <laughs> it's like the meta practice. If it's only the words, it just do. <laughs> but you want the resonance that follows as well. Anyway, it all starts with right thought in the mind. So please be encouraged to do a little bit of meta practice every day. So now is the time for questions. And uh, I was tempted to keep meditating because you've asked so many questions already today. But um, I don't know if it's now becoming the questioning time. <laughs> okay. okay. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to send a question. So there is one question that is coming directly to me and I will paraphrase because it's quite um, a lot of things in there. But what I sense is that uh, this person is saying that they felt a bit hurt because their question wasn't passed on to Ajahn today. And they were wondering if it's because it wasn't useful and the sensitivity that came up around that. And also you wrote to Anna Kumpa to offer your service and apparently were told that we didn't need help right now. So both of these two things have triggered a feeling of sensitivity and feeling a little bit rejected. So speaking to the sensitivity and rejection, first of all, it's a very, it's very brave of you to write this and to bring it up in this way. Um, because rejection, the fear of rejection and abandonment, I know for me, that's a big one. Um, and it's very painful to feel rejected. So it does take a lot of courage and vulnerability to express it. And, you know, sometimes when we have this feeling, especially as one of, in my case anyway, one of my main kind of aspects of my psychological makeup, it's so easy to find lots of things outside to justify that. So firstly, I'd like to refer to the question that you mentioned. I definitely hadn't seen your question or realized that anything had been left out. So certainly there was no judgment of any questions being not useful. Um, so please write it again, especially if it was an important question, but I feel this one's even more important. And about the project, thank you so much for your support. I know you and I know you've been a great supporter. And at the moment in the project, one of the things I'm really struggling with is that I'm managing everything. So I'm managing all the volunteers and if people write to wishing to contribute, I know that I have to find the time to bring them into the project and to take them on and to orient them into a new role. And sometimes I just have got no more capacity whatsoever to do that, unfortunately. So at this point in the project, we have quite a lot of people already working in admin roles, but later on when we have a place, then it's going to become a lot, lot easier to take more people in because we're going to be actually relating to people in person and people are going to be coming by, we get to know you, you get to know us, and everybody's offer of help is so deeply appreciated. It's really the lifeblood of what we're doing. And without you, it would be nothing. We simply couldn't operate. It has to be a community effort. But for me personally, at the moment, I'm almost burning out. I can turn up to a talk and look shiny because I love to, uh, to teach the Dhamma. I love to share the Dhamma. But it's actually not the time to expand right now. It's the time for me to recuperate especially next year, I want to recuperate a bit. And I really ask for your understanding around that and um, forgiveness if anything 
in our way of responding or not responding to you has brought up feelings of rejection and hurt. It's certainly not the case that anybody is not anything other than highly valued. And I do hope you'll stick around longer term. So I hope that that spoke to it a little bit. And I would say in terms of rejection feelings and hurt and sensitivity, this is a very natural part of the path as well. And this can come up on retreat because we are in a sensitive space. And it's one of the reasons we say that we want everybody to join and to stay for the whole retreat and also to join on your own screen so that each of us is in our own little bubble supporting the others. It's really important to have that sense of group support and safety so that you can actually share this kind of thing, right? So really appreciate that. And I hope that that spoke to it a little bit. And please feel free to write in your question again if anything was missed today, okay? So I hope that helps. About the sensitivity and rejection, also just remembering to meet them with kindness and without judgment, you know? Sensitivity can be a really beautiful thing especially if we learn to be sensitive to what the sensitivity needs right now, yeah? Can you be sensitive to what you need? What is that rejection asking for, you know? Because it's certainly something deeper, you know, these things go back to the past, maybe many past lives. Sometimes we don't necessarily know how to identify the cause, but that's not so important. It's more a matter of how can I care for this feeling of rejection? What does it feel like? How does it manifest for you in the body? And how can you learn to stay a little bit present with that? And writing it out is also one way. Huh? Acknowledging. Acknowledging it. Being honest to it. And seeking some support. So go gently with yourself, especially when you're feeling sensitive. Yeah. And definitely, if you have offered your support, we'll be in touch at the right time. <laughs> I don't see all of the messages because it's just, I, I just can't see all my emails. It, it's never ending. So <laughs> I so, sometimes feel like just buried under a, a kind of swamp. So, okay. Yesterday, I said that boredom is a type of ill will. Can I expand on that? Yeah, boredom, I think, is a subtle kind of ill will, but it's it's more a lack of seeing the beauty in the moment, a lack of seeing anything really worthwhile or valuable in the moment. So because of that, the mind kind of dulls out. And sometimes it even becomes bored because it wants to get away from something. You know, it would rather just kind of look to distract itself. And that's what we think of as boredom. So it's a kind of mental state that isn't able to stay with the object. Perhaps the mindfulness is not bright enough. And because of that, you can't see very much of what's happening. You know, there is something happening. There is maybe the breath coming in and going out. But because your mind is not energized, because your mindfulness is not bright and there's not enough gladness in the mind, that breath just seems very dull and boring and the mind just won't stay there at all. So one of the antidotes for boredom is the same as other kinds of ill will, is the contentment, being contented with the experience. And also, of course, meta practice, right? Giving your mind a boost through meta. So these are, and, and give it a try, because sometimes we're not quite sure if the boredom's stemming from ill will or if it's stemming from just tiredness, sleepiness, a lack of contentment until we try the antidotes. And sometimes if you try some meta practice or maybe some chanting or, you know, maybe changing your posture or whatever. And if you find that works, then it does show it suggests that there was some um, ill will in the mind, especially if the meta works. It suggests that that meta has helped you overcome um, some subtle ill will. Ill will is maybe not the best translation because to our minds I guess as English speakers ill will tends to imply anger or actual not wishing another person well but in this context it just means that it's in the sphere of um, aversion what's called aversion rather than it's the sphere of pulling away of withdrawing retracting from experience rather than grasping it which is more of the sense desire so it's more of a moving away from our experience. So to see if you can find ways to connect. Wow, now lots of, uh, oh. <laughs> I'm glad that my answer to the first question helped. And 
I know the importance and power of generosity, but whatever I give, I never feel it's enough. And what I can give is overshadowed by a sense of inadequacy. How to overcome this and rejoice in what I can do. Yeah, again, it comes down to training the mind. The way we can learn to rejoice in what we do is to practice rejoicing in what we do, to intentionally bring it up in the mind. And this is quite counterintuitive, I think, to most people in this culture, in, in British culture anyway. You know, if people ask us how we are, sometimes we feel the best we can say is not bad. <laughs> you know, or if we do something for someone and someone thanks us even quite profoundly and you know genuinely we're like no 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 it's nothing it's nothing and it just you know that praise just bounces right off it's like we've got some kind of resistance to accepting it apparently in um psychology they did some tests and they found that uh criticism goes in with a, in about two seconds any perceived criticism even when it's not criticism goes in <laughs> in about two seconds and praise takes about 30 seconds to register so I tend to just give a lot, give quite a lot. Um, and I've seen that sometimes people feel a bit um, embarrassed by that, but I don't care. I just keep going until they actually receive it because sometimes there's a real resistance and they're like, no, 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 stop saying that. No, it's you that's like that. It's you that's like that. Nope, I'm saying I see it in you. <laughs> and it's such a relief when they're able to accept it. It's a relief for the giver as well. So... If you feel that whatever you give is not enough, you can, whatever I give, I never feel it's enough. Maybe you're not really recognizing all that you give. Maybe you can start writing down the things that you do, you know, just like you would write a gratitude journal. You could also write down gratitude for yourself, gratitude for all the lovely things you've done, and also all the things you haven't done, all the unwholesome things you've restrained or refrained from. Yeah, because today you probably didn't kill an ant, hopefully. There aren't many ants around, but, you know, maybe you <laughs> didn't do many things you could have done. You didn't react when you could, when you might have ordinarily really reacted or you did the washing up when you didn't really have to. You just did it as an offering to your get to your friend and your companion. So see if you can jot it down, I would say, and focus on that. One of the things Ajahn Brown once um, talked about, I think it happened in a classroom somewhere with a very skillful teacher. She got the kids to write out stuff they liked about themselves and stuff they didn't like about themselves <clears throat> in a list. And of course, the one about what they liked was shorter than the one they didn't like. And then she said, OK, rip it up in two and put the don't like in the dustbin. Forget about that. And this might seem like not being <clears throat> true to the reality because all those things could be said to exist. But really, are they? I mean, or are is what exists simply whatever we perceive at this moment in time. So see if you can train your mind to perceive the beauty in yourself, in your generosity. Sometimes we don't have material things to give, but we give of ourselves, we give of our time, we give of our friendship. Yeah. So give yourself permission, first of all, to rejoice and then make it part of your practice. I think of it as a kind of mudita for oneself. Because often when the Brahma Viharas are taught, the metta, mudita, karuna, and upeka, we think of them all as to oneself and others, except for mudita, right? We always think mudita is rejoicing in other people's good fortune and success. But what about rejoicing in our own? And that's a kind of gratitude to oneself, a kind of mudita to oneself. So do please practice that. It's very good when we realize what our weaknesses are and we can practice them. Oh my goodness, suddenly the time is going fast. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. Someone said it's sad that we face resistance with the Bhikkhuni project within the UK Buddhist community. The Buddha mentioned and referred so many times to Bhikkhunis. Thank you. Yes, it is a shame and I don't know why, because I would think, I mean, for myself, if I benefit from something, I want everybody else to have the opportunity too. So. If certain monks have benefited, then why wouldn't they want nuns to benefit too? I don't know. <laughs> but there's a lot of politics and, you know, all sorts of dynamics there. So I think the best thing to do, rather than worrying about that, is just for me to do my bit. And if it takes longer than expected, or even if it takes my whole lifetime, 
at least we're making a start. You know, we've made a good start. We do have um, funds now. I mean, not quite enough for the property market at this time, but um, we're getting there. And, you know, our charitable trust is specifically for bikunis. Like we made that really watertight in the constitution because so many times monasteries develop and it's a little bit too loose. And later on, because there's usually more monks than nuns, the monks come in and say, let's vote out the nuns. That happened with Aya Kemar's monastery. And she was a very famous, very powerful bhikkhuni um, from Germany. And she was trained in Sri Lanka and then started a monastery in Australia. And to this day, that monastery is just for monks. So we do have foundations in place to have something for women, but it will be modest, it will be small, because I'm on my own with this, and um, as a bikuni, and that's hard, spiritually, that's very difficult to be the only person in robes, I never see another person in robes, you know, it's been two years almost now, with the exception of about one and a half hours meeting another nun, so yeah, I want to change things, because I could just say, let's go to a small little cutie somewhere else and just practice and get really into my meditation and take do as much as I possibly can in this life to get out of samsara, which I have tried to do in the past. <laughs> but it gets to the point where there's no structure to hold us, especially if it doesn't work in one place, then there's no actual structure in place for bikunis to exist. So somebody has to take the first steps and there are things happening you know there are little places all over Europe I mean not all over but in some places small places and um, a few in California and of course a bigger one in Perth um, so it's something it's a start okay that was a kind of long answer to a comment my experiences with meta have ranged from barely perceptible to intensely joyful almost overwhelming this often brings tears with it. It's a lot of feeling. Is this really metta? Shouldn't it be more steady and less excited? Something feels out of control and I don't always know what to do with it. As pleasant as it is, there can be a component of discomfort or too big feeling. Yeah, all of it's fine, <laughs> you know, because these things happen because of causes and effects. I mean, of causes and conditions. And it's all part of purifying the metta. Sometimes it might feel overwhelming. Sometimes it might be a lot of emotion, but that's just part of the path. Um, over time, it might quieten down, but it really doesn't matter. I think the reason that it can feel overwhelming and that you're asking the question um, is possibly because you do feel a little bit out of control. And this is challenging to the sense of self. Ironically, it's what happens when we do start to let go. <laughs> These emotions can come because we're not trying to prevent them or stop them. You know, it's nature just taking its course. But then at some point we get a little bit like, whoa, this is too much for me. And that can happen with the pleasant emotions even more so than with the, um, the more suffering emotions because in a way we're attached to our suffering and we're not used to this kind of pleasure in meditation. So, I mean, I've had this many times that I feel like, oh, I think this is too much for me. Like, this feels like intense, really intense. And you know Ajahn Brahm's phrase about the bliss better than sex, which is kind of a little bit coarse, but I mean, that is an indication of just how incredibly mind-blowing pleasure of meditation can be. Of course, it's a very, very different pleasure. It's based on wholesomeness and it's not a sensuality. It's actually what happens when we start to withdraw from the five senses and it's a pleasure and bliss born of purifying the mind. So it's quite safe, but it does take getting a little bit used to. And it's just a matter of familiarity. I was on a retreat one time in Perth. I mean, many times I've done about eight rains retreats there. So every year, uh, normally outside of COVID. Um, and I was getting a lot of bliss coming up, mainly because I was doing very little in my meditation. And I actually went through a period of complete self and torpor for about three days, right in the middle of a three month retreat. Because it's amazing, like when you really dare to do nothing and you really go through the tiredness, it kind of manifests, but then eventually it clears. And after that, all this pity, all this bliss started to come. And I thought, my goodness, I don't know if I can handle this. 
And then I went to the Dhamma talk and Ajahn Brahm talked about patience, kanti, as waiting in the moment. And he said, you have to endure every experience, endure the suffering and in, even endure the bliss. And you know, when you're experiencing something and the teacher says a couple of words and it's like ping, <laughs> you feel they're speaking to you. He said, endure the bliss. And I was like, oh my goodness, he understands. And then I realized this is just another sensation. It's another experience to learn to be comfortable, contented and at ease with, right? So the Buddha said, we have to explore the whole field of experience. Ajahn Brahm's translation of Vedana, the whole field, pleasant, unpleasant and anything in between. So this is your opportunity. Don't worry too much. Don't do anything with it. But if it really is overwhelming, then just stop the meditation very gently and have a little break if you're really getting freaked out. <laughs> and then maybe continue in the walking posture or something like that, you know. Just, just go gently. But you're quite safe. You're really quite safe. And let the emotions come. Emotions are a good thing. Goodness, we've got a lot of questions. I better be quicker. I'm just like Ajahn Pro, speaking too much. <laughs> when practicing metta, where is the line between attachment and intention? May you be happy. Do we cultivate aversion towards unhappy states? No, you don't um, cultivate aversion to unhappy states. It's more of a well-wishing. It's not really that we're trying to be happy. It's more that we're trying to encapsulate a wholesome intention in words. Many people don't like may you be happy precisely because of that. And so you might wish to change the words to something like may you be content. I think that's really nice because contentment means a kind of happiness, if you like, with anything. Right? It's not necessarily the feeling of happiness. It's a contentment with it all. So see if you can play with the words there. But don't worry, it's really got nothing to do with attachment. It's an intention of well-wishing, of benevolence towards another being. And also with metta, you know, sometimes, yeah, craving attachment can arise because that's one of the near enemies that's described. But it's not that you're increasing attachment by practicing metta. It's more that the obstacles to metta will start to be evident when you practice. So all of these practices are also insight practices. They show us the impurities in our mind. They show us where the metta is not yet purified. It doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. It just means attachment still there and the more you practice the more that will change with your intention with the purity of your intention and become more and more unconditional oh somebody's asking about the sutta that's nice i was worried that i'd overloaded you with sutta quotes <laughs> maybe for some um so my question is about the wilderness of the heart sutta i'd be grateful if you could point out where i might find it yes it's Majjhima Kaya number 16 so that's this book, and it's called Chetokila Sutta, which means the wilderness of the heart. Or if there are any reflections I might hear or read. So I won't talk more about it now, because now you know where to find it, and we've got a lot of questions. But um, I would suggest after the retreat, reading it, and also having a look at any of Ajahn Brahmali or Ajahn Brahm's recorded Sutta talks. They may well have one on that Sutta, and that really helps to unpack these things. Okay. You often chant sabbe sata, sabbe pana, and it gives much joy and kindness. I find the words on the internet, but not of its part of a bigger text. Or is it a chanting in itself? I think it's a, a chanting in itself. It's words taken from the Pali Canon, but put together a certain way in Myanmar. So it's a Burmese chant. I don't know if they chant it that way in other countries too, but I learned it in Myanmar when I was uh, living there. Dear Venerable, is gratitude similar to metta? Yeah, interesting question. I mean, I do think that all these qualities fuel and strengthen each other and enrich each other. And I personally feel that someone I have gratitude towards is a very easy object to generate metta toward. I might have mentioned to you in the uh, metta uh, classes that we do on Saturdays. Generally, we have a regular metta class, metta meditation group. And... Um, one time I chose uh, one loved person for the whole retreat. It was about two weeks of meta practice. And I just chose one person because with one object, you can go deeper 
into the meta like in a more sustained way and the person I chose was someone who'd actually um, offered me my ticket to that retreat and sponsored the cost so it was very easy to generate meta because I had this beautiful feeling of gratitude so I think sometimes they overlap but not always it's also possible to have meta without gratitude you know because meta is eventually develop to all living beings, even those we feel annoyed with, even those we don't really know. There may be no feeling of gratitude in the beginning, but later you never know. They might become your object of gratitude for giving you the chance to develop meta further. So yeah, you can play with how those qualities relate and interrelate. In Poland, we have live sittings or meetings and no resistance toward bikinis. There's no monastic sangha yet. <laughs> you're always welcome to come and visit when you invite me then I shall come so long as I have time <laughs> that's the only caveat so yeah we, we just need an invitation solid invitation and uh, yeah if you want to organize something maybe a three-day retreat or longer one day I will have capacity but right now I'm kind of the only teacher and also manager and also volunteer organizer and anyway many many things <laughs> so it's a little bit of a stretch but please do invite me that's wonderful I'm glad that there's no resistance towards bikinis and I think in this country it's made more difficult because there's an existing sangha which is a very um, dominant sangha I mean they've been here for I don't know since the 80s I guess um, and you know they're very senior monks and they did take a direct decision um, not to support bhikkhuni ordination for whatever reason but you know that sort of decision is sometimes said to come from Thailand and I'm sure that that influenced the situation uh, but they chose to stay loyal to that. Ajahn Brahm from the same tradition but he had a different understanding of loyalty. I think his first loyalty is to the Buddha and to what's right in his heart. I'm sure that many of the monks here also know what's right in their heart, but for some reason or another, they feel that it's not yet possible to, uh, to support this. So anyway, we're carrying on regardless. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm feeling quite jovial Oh, jovial and sprightly today and worrying that it means my mind is not bright with mindfulness. <laughs> Sounds like it's quite mindful. Is it normal to feel like that at times during a retreat? Or I just want to sometimes give you all a virtual hug and tell you that whatever you feel is normal because what else is, is reality other than what we experience, you know? Everything you experience is normal in the sense that it's arisen. And so it's real. And so it has to be normal <laughs> because it's there. So, you know, if that's how you're feeling, then wonderful. Try to enjoy that and accept that and notice what's happening for you. You know, it's all part of the mindfulness practice. So jovial and, jovial and sprightly is a kind of energy. It could be arising due to the retreat. It could be arising physically. It could be arising because it was a bit sunny in the afternoon. Whatever the reason, um, the only thing I sometimes find with that, because I do get jovial and sprightly sometimes, is that uh, sometimes I try, I use that energy to engage with others, not when I'm on retreat, but sometimes I use that energy um, in different ways, you know, maybe to work or whatever. But if I'm not careful, I can burn it out that way. Whereas if, especially I'm on retreat, and I can sit down with that jovial, sprightly energy and harness it and put it into my meditation, then that is the most powerful and that makes it really worthwhile. So see if you can not allow it to go too far <laughs> and to become too externalized, um, but see if you can experience it internally and take it into your practice. Yeah. Take it into your practice just means allow it to be there and allow it to either quieten or continue as it wishes, not as you would like it to do. So I think that is all of the questions. And um, please forgive me if we ever miss any questions. It's definitely not personal because we really do try to come to all the questions. Okay, so that's all that Derek has. And um, 
and I think it's time to say good night. So hopefully, oh, another message. Just check. Oh gosh. Okay. I think it's a longer message. Okay. I'm not sure. Should I say this comment or not? Uh, do you want to write another message? I'm not sure whether you want me to read it out or not. <laughs> okay. Thank you for it anyway. So that's really nice. Good. Thank you for all being so real and honest and open and vulnerable. It's a great inspiration to me. And I wish you a very good night's sleep. Remember Meta as you go to bed. Bye bye. See you tomorrow. Mm -hmm.